Welcome back to our study in the book of Hebrews. Today is our final session. We've spent the last nine weeks digging through the book, and I really hope you've grown, that you have enjoyed to dig into the theology and the philosophy, the biblical context that this book is situated in. There are so many important truths for our faith to have to, to glean from this book and to really grasp them. It takes some context, some digging, and I hope that you've enjoyed doing that and growing in that process. And today we come to a section that in a lot of ways can be confusing. The placement can be confusing where we've had this book diving into theology and philosophy and, and Levitical law. And then all of a sudden we have some shifts. And it's not purposeless. It's not random. It really does fit. And, and we're going to dig into that a little bit. But let's jump right in here to Hebrews 13, 4 through 5. We have this teaching where it says marriage is to be honored by all. Marriage bed kept undefiled. God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterers. And then he says, keep your life free from the love of money. So you have these two exhortations, these two pleas with other Christians that almost seem out of place. He's not talked about marriage at all. He's not really talked about money at all. He's talked about the covenant. He's talked about faith. He's talked about philosophy as far as using terms like hypostasis and why are we all of a sudden talking about marriage and why are we talking about money? Well, because we're talking about living. And all theology, all worship happens in the context of a life surrounded by desire. And much of human desire can be boiled down to finances and lust. It can be boiled down to a desire for um, sexual immorality and to a desire to become an elite status and a pursuit of power and money. And what he is saying is free yourself from those desires by be set, being satisfied with what you have. For he himself said, I will never leave or abandon you. So what we have is that Jesus will never leave or abandon us. It's, it's the eternal presence of God. That's what we have. And he's saying, be satisfied with that, which means we don't chase other situations in life. We don't chase sexual immorality. We don't chase lust. We don't chase a, a desire for power, for a desire for status, for a desire for finance. And this actually comes in front of another Hellenistic, another Greek philosophy called hedonism. You may have heard the, the term, well, we just, you know, everything is, is hedonist. There's hedonistic people all around the world. You, you might not really know where that comes from. But what it is, is in Hellenistic philosophy, there was a view. There's a lot of different views in, in ancient philosophy. And one of them was that all that exists is what we see that exists. That only this finite world exists. And if that's the case, if all that exists is our reality, meaning there is no undergirding reality, there is no eternal truth, there is no concrete reality in which all of our experience comes from, all that exists is the experience. So in a hedonistic view, that's all that exists. The experience is all that exists. If that's true, then you're going to live for the pursuit of happiness. You're going to live for joys, no matter how short-lived they might be, you're going to live for pleasure. And that's the hedonist mentality, is that pleasure is the basis of existence. That pleasure is the basis of living. So, you pursue money, you pursue sexual immorality, because you find pleasure in those things. What the author of Hebrews is saying is, the experience is not all there is. The experience comes from something eternal. And because we are grafted into this eternal, eternal reality, and this eternal reality bubbles over into our finite experience, why would we ever try to live based on money, or based on sexual immorality, or based on any type of fleeting pleasure that is sinful? Instead, be satisfied, he says. Be satisfied in our experience that is rooted in the eternal, concrete reality of God. In so doing, 
uh, he moves from that and he says, basically, be satisfied in our situation, therefore, so that we may boldly say three things. And these come from Psalm 118, verse 6. I would encourage you to read Psalm 118. It's a very moving and powerful psalm. But in this quote, he's essentially saying there are three things that we can boldly say. One, the Lord is my helper. Two, I will not be afraid. And three, this rhetorical question, what can man do for me? So the Lord is my helper. So meaning, this doesn't mean that if if I'm suffering or sick or need a million dollars, if I ask that, God will give it. It means that no matter what situation I find myself in, I have a peace. And one of the things that Jesus says in the Beatitudes are, are blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, that doesn't mean that God's going to raise the person who just recently died, is going to raise them just so you can have them again. But it's saying that he's there. He's comforting us. God doesn't erase the experience, but he joins us in the experience. His concrete reality comes alongside us and infiltrates our experience without doing away with the suffering. He's our helper. Therefore, we don't have to be afraid. Now, what this means, it doesn't mean that anxiety is gone. It just means that if we are living for an eternal reality, if that eternal reality is always already resting within us, what situation or circumstance do we have to be fearful of here? It's all finite. It's all fleeting. It's all moving. And that doesn't diminish what someone might be going through. If you're going through an illness like cancer, if you're going through a financial struggle where you don't know where your next meal is, that is a fearful time to be in. But he's saying, I won't let that fear dictate me. Well, why? Because if we're believers, we don't, we, what we believe is that we have an eternal reality, an eternal presence in God, an eternal place in God's presence awaiting for us. So no experience in this life can diminish eternal value. And and that's what it called it comes down to is is value. The hedonist culture says that because there is nothing eternal, what we hold as valuable is what we should pursue. If you hold power and money as valuable, that's what you need to pursue. If you hold pleasure and 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 lust as valuable, that's what you pursue. But we know that there is something eternal. Which means that is all that it is more valuable than anything else. The author of Ecclesiastes paints this picture by saying everything is meaningless. Why does he say everything is meaningless? Because everything is fleeting. Young age is fleeting. Money and power is fleeting because it doesn't stay with you. The only thing that has value is eternity. So we don't have to be afraid because we have eternity. Therefore, what can man do to me? What can man do for me? There's another way to read this as well. Man can't cause me any suffering that diminishes the value of eternity. There's never going to be a suffering. Look at the the persecuted churches in North Korea and in China that continue to keep worshiping and praising God, even if they're doing it in hiding, even if they're doing it in public. I was watching a documentary on the North Korean church, and they have found ways to worship in public by making statements, exalting God and praying to God that they do it in public. And there is a chance that they will be killed for doing it, but they do it anyway because no suffering can erase the value of their God, of our God, of of the eternal concrete reality that we are now part of through Jesus. What can man do to me? Nothing. What can man give me? Nothing. There is nothing more valuable than eternity. So all of this comes down to the situation that we live. We can face any situation because of value. The eternal value of the concrete eternal experience that bleeds into our, our finite experience makes every situation, makes us able to go through any situation makes every situation tolerable, makes every situation something we can find joy in because we're not, we're not defined by situation. We're not defined by circumstance. We're not defined by possession. We're defined as Christians by the homo usius, 
homostasis that, that we're a part of. That we're defined by this concrete reality brought to us by our mediator of the new covenant. Therefore, how do we live this out? Well, we come then to a, we go from all of the statement about situation to this, <clears throat> to this teaching from the, from the book of Leviticus. And if you want some more background on that, it comes from Leviticus 16, verses 20 through 28. And this teaching has to do with cleansing the holy place. So if you remember our drawing of the tabernacle, you have the tabernacle uh, courtyard with the wall set up. And then you have the tabernacle and you have the holy place and the most holy place. And the most holy place, that was where God's presence was. And once a year on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go in and cleanse that. Because all of God's people, all of Israel, had to be cleansed in order to be in right standing with God. They would, he would go in and cleanse it. And then he'd come out to the altar, and they would take an animal, and they would sacrifice that animal. And they would lay hands on that animal. And the carcass of the animal, or the animal would take all the sins of the people, the animal would die, and the carcass of that animal would then be taken. So if you have the camp surrounding Israel here, the carcass would then be taken outside of the camp. And more than that, there would be a person that would carry that carcass outside the camp, and there would be a person that would that would um, carry the animal that had all the sin imputed onto it, so there was two animals, that would be taken outside of the camp as well. Now, those people had to go through all sorts of ritual cleansing and stuff to then come back inside the camp. What the book of Hebrews is saying, what the teacher is saying here, is that Jesus is the one who offers it, offers the sacrifice on the altar, but he's also the one that goes outside the camp. He's the one that's disgraced. He's the one that is taken outside. He's the one that, that bears all of the sins of the world and gives us the righteousness. It all happens through him, and then he goes outside the camp. And the reason the teacher is bringing this up is to say that we then, because he has done that, therefore, let us, application, go to him outside the camp. Let us, too, bear that type of disgrace. Let us bear... A, a, a desire to serve others. Let us bear a diminishing factor. You know, think about how many Christians you know, which is, it's sad to think about, but how often do we come across someone that looks at themselves as being better than other people, that exalts themselves because they do things right or because they're holy or, or whatever. How many people do we know that we look at and we think, man, they just make you feel bad. It's not Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. He is God. He is fully righteous. And yet, he's the one that goes outside of the camp. While everyone else stays inside the camp. And the author of Hebrews is saying, who are we to exalt ourselves? Who are we to try to accumulate situation and status and power? Who are we to say that we're the ones that are righteous when our righteousness is given from him? So instead of staying in the camp, we go outside the camp to him. We serve him. We serve others. We diminish ourselves to make him greater. We kneel before his throne, not before our throne. That's what the application here is. is Any time we go through life trying to alleviate our status, we're acting against what it means to go outside of the camp to serve others. So why do we ensure that we serve God? Why do we ensure... We bow at his throne and not ours, because we don't have an internal enduring sitting here, enduring city here. We seek the one to come. If if this reality was eternal, then yes, by all means, seek after things that make our status better. Seek after things that elevate us above others. Because this is eternal. We're here. We're trying to make ourselves lords. But no. We serve the one who is God. We serve the one who is king. We serve the one who made himself lesser. So why would we do anything to establish ourselves in a better way here? This experience, this life, this reality is momentary. We live for one that is eternal. 
Let's go outside of the camp. Let's diminish ourselves to serve other people, to bow at his throne rather than ours. Let's continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise, confessing his name, not confessing ours. That's the application of the message of Christianity. We exist <laughs> because we weren't good enough, and we could never be good enough. We are in God's kingdom. We are God's people because he made himself lesser. He went outside the camp. He bore our disgrace. He took on our unrighteousness. Why would we ever stand on that and say, look at us, look at how good I am? No, we serve as he served us. That's what we're called into. That's the application of what it means to be a part of the new covenant. Now, we've studied a lot of theology this past summer. We've studied a lot of biblical context. We've studied a lot of philosophy. And I would like to encourage you with the same exhortation that the author of Hebrews encourages his readers and his audience with. And I would like to remind you that through all of this theology, through all of this teaching on, on our faith, we're called to make ourselves lesser, to serve the world, to be ambassadors of the kingdom of God, to live in this already because we've already been brought into this concrete eternal reality, to live in anticipation of that, to experience that already while we await for the fullness of that experience to come. That's what we're called into. Now let me just close with this exhortation reading straight from the author of Hebrews in chapter 13, verses 20 through 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with every good to do his will, working in what is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. As people as part of this covenant, we don't exist to make ourselves known. We return back to what it means to be made in the image of God. We exist to bear the glory of God who has indwelled us with his spirit. We exist to give God glory for who he is and for what he has done. We do that already as part of his kingdom, and we will forever be doing that in his presence in the kingdom to come. Thank you for being a part of this study this summer. I'm so glad to have had you join along. Let me just pray to close out our time. Father, we worship your name. And we don't do it because we're good. We don't do it because we've earned it. We do it because of your son. We lift his name high because he lowered himself. We lift his name high because he took on our unrighteousness. Jesus, we lift your name. Help us to live it out, to serve others, to serve you, to glorify you, to not sit at our throne or to glorify ourselves, but thank you for who you are, for bringing us into this new covenant through your work, that we might worship you and be a, your kingdom of, of believers already. But Lord, plant that desire for your not yet kingdom, for that eternal presence planted in our hearts that we live in anticipation of that, no matter what situation might come in our life. Thank you for bringing us into your people. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining throughout this, this series this summer. Look forward to continuing to grow and study and worship together already in the here and now but for all of eternity as brothers and sisters in Christ.